Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining Museum Book Club. And um, thank you for listening to Matt Mondrant tonight. Um, so I'm Ivy Albright. I'm the museum curator. And I'm going to hand it off to Matt to um, <laughs> start speaking. We have people in person um, attending, um, watching a live stream here in the Wortham Auditorium at the Rosenberg Library. We also have people participating from at home on their Zoom links. Um, for those of you on Zoom, if you have any questions for Matt um, at the end of his presentation, please put it in the chat box and I'll make sure those questions get answered um, for you guys um, and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thanks, Ivy. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. Thanks for joining me for this book club event. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with folks uh, in Galveston once again. I was able to do an event there when the book first came out back in June. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Ivy and the Roseburg Library Museum for setting up this uh, event and for the book club. And I hope everyone you know, has a copy of the book and is maybe uh, started enjoying it already. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a short presentation about some of the uh, historical aspects and, and inspirations for the novel, just to give you a sense of how the book came about and how I kind of put it together. Um, and then, and then uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, open it up for, for any kind of questions uh, you'd like to have. We can have a conversation about the book, about um, the events in the book, or writing historical novels, or anything else you would like to talk about. Uh, okay, so we'll start off with the aftermath of the 1900 Galveston hurricane. Now this is material that I don't have to uh, uh, tell you guys too much about. Uh, I know everybody in Galveston is, is quite familiar with the, 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 the hurricane of 1900 and its history. Um, but clearly this was a, a, a large influence um, on me, the, really the starting point. Um, my wife was doing a PhD in American history and she was doing it on immigration through Galveston, Texas, um, in the period of 1880 to 1920. So the hurricane falls right in the middle. So obviously the hurricane and a lot of the research that she was doing had to do with that. And she was started to, this is about 15 years ago. She started to unearth all these different interesting anecdotal pieces of information um, that really helped, uh, you know, that caught my attention and helped me put, sort of put the book together. But clearly the scope and scale of this disaster um, you know, still considered the greatest um, disaster in American history in terms of loss of life, um, has been something that I've been interested in for a long time. My family uh, has been coming to Galveston for, or I've been coming there for at least 20 years. My wife is born and raised in Austin. Her family vacationed there when she was young. So we have a long history of being there. Um, and it's always been, I've always been fascinated by uh, the, the hurricane and the aftermath and really the history of Galveston overall. Um, several of these images were significant to me. Uh, you know, basically the, what, what I'm going to be showing you here in this presentation is a series of different kinds of images, all of which had an influence on how I characterized the city of Galveston, the aftermath of the hurricane, the way things looked and, and felt and the mood and tone of things um, was really in, in, informed by these, by these photos. Um, you know, perhaps even more so than a lot of the written accounts of which, of course, I read many um, in my research. Uh, the, you know, the, this this photo of the church and the and the uh, the tower still remaining um, figures into the 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 opening scenes, uh, for example. Um, also, the, the the this in the aftermath, the kind of difficult scenarios of. Um, the cleanup, uh, but also disposing of the bodies, um, the, 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 you know, the terrible carnage and um, the marshalling together of groups of men. Um, and, and I was also particularly interested in, uh, you know, how they, 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 they gathered groups of, of black men in particular at gunpoint at times and basically forced them to collect bodies and to put them uh, either onto the the charnel fires on the beach to be burned or to be disposed elsewhere, um, and just the uh, one of the things that really struck me about these photos and about the story of the Galveston hurricane overall was the tremendous loss of life, but just um, how 
the, the you know it was hard to escape the the carnage um the bodies everywhere um the stench of it um you know all the the other terrible things that go along with it there was no way i could do a book that had, that dealt with this time period um immediately after the storm without without accounting for that at least i felt i felt i had a responsibility to depict that um okay so this gets us to one of the primary characters of the uh, the, the three main characters, one of the three main characters, and that is Joe Kowinski, who's known as Chris, Chrysanthemum Joe, considered by many to be the greatest Jewish American boxer of all time. This is a picture of Joe in 1890. This is back in his prime in his young 20s. Um, he was also known as the California Terror, a couple other different nicknames. Uh, he was known for a few things. His, his father was a uh, an immigrant, a Jewish immigrant um, from Poland. It was a uh, an intellectual. He ran a bookstore and a uh, literary salon in San Francisco. Uh, Bret Hart and Mark Twain used to come and, and hang out and, and talk to his father. Um, comes from this sort of uh, literary tradition, intellectual tradition. And yet as a young teenager, Joe spent most of his time on the docks in San Francisco fighting with sailors. Uh, this was something that really sort of struck me as interesting. Uh, a, a character that I wanted to learn more about. So Joe was brought to Galveston right after the hurricane to do a fight to, um, to raise some money. And that's how he kind of enters this picture. Um, this is a, a playing card that I have a friend of mine found in a collectible and gave it to me. So, you know, Joe Kowinski at the time, um, you know, this is a 1910, but, you know, he was, an, he was a semi-famous person. He, he would have been known certainly to any boxing aficionados um, uh, he never won a championship, but he, he beat a lot of the best of, uh, boxers of the era, like Bob Fitzsimmons and others. So he, uh, was a known quantity. Um, this is him in 1900, about 32, he's about 32 years old at the time. So this is where he is in the, um, in the novel. And it's fair to say at this point, he was in the sort of downside of his career, or he had already peaked and was kind of, um, he was growing older as you know, as you know, uh, in your thirties, uh, being a boxer is difficult. And of course, by this time, he'd already had about 75 fights. I mean, a ton of professional fights. Of course, he'd had tons of amateur fights before that beginning when he was a very young teenager. Um, here's another shot of Joe when he was younger. He was a, a, a sort of physical marvel, very much into uh, training and um, diet. Um, he was known for his, um, you know, his, sort of cardio training and strength training and stuff that wasn't you know as known or popular at that time um he was he was kind of obsessive about it um and he was about 175 pounds at his fighting weight which is very light of course for a heavyweight he could have fought you know light heavyweight um uh which he did a few times but uh he probably could have dominated that weight division but you know he wanted to be the best the best in the world and and for a long time the heavyweight champion of the world of course is considered the the best um, so he was known for his physique. He was a, an, an attractive younger guy, liked to wear his hair uh, long, didn't like to wear hats, um, was fond of quoting Shakespeare and Cervantes and other uh, literary figures in his speech. So he was a very unusual, he liked clothes, he liked to dress well, he uh, had a house, uh, he collected antiques, he was a uh, um, so he was a very unusual boxer. And so this is also the things that kind of drew me into his story. So I found this, um, this telegram that was sent to Joe Kowinski from Jack Curley, who's this fight promoter. And this is, is this is replicated in the novel. Um, and as you can see here, they, they, they're, they're asking him to come down to Galveston to fight Jack Johnson. And they're saying that he's bragging too much, want to shut him up, $1,500 plus expenses, knock him out early if you want. Uh, this tells us several things. One, um, th they selected Joe to do this because Joe was one of the only fighters that would cross the color line, as it was called. He's one of the few white boxers that would take on black boxers of that period. Um, he did it often. Also, it, it demonstrates that Jack Johnson was already a notable figure in Galveston, despite the fact he was only 22 years old. He'd only had a couple fights, but he was already making a name for himself. Those of you that know anything about Jack Johnson, you know that for the rest of his career and the rest of his life, he was a larger than life figure, one of the most famous men in America and in the world, 
um, arguably the most famous uh, black man in the world the decade. I'm sorry, Matt. Um, I'm sorry. A lot of that had to do with his I don't know what his um, his at his uh, outspoken nature. Let's say he was he was fond of um, of uh, you know making jokes and laughing and um, doing a lot of things that um, some folks didn't feel um, a black man should be doing in society at that time. So. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot contained here, you know, not okay. just that also. So, so that means there are people there that want Joe Coincy to come down there and knock him out, not only knock him out, but they clearly want him. They, they want to hurt him. They want to shut him up. Um, so that puts Joe in this strange position where he's, you know, he knows why he's coming there. Um, he knows that he's an older fighter. It's very common to have an older fighter fight these young up and comers, you know, to test them and that kind of thing. He knows that because he's Jewish and because he fights across the color line, um, that's also why they selected him. So it puts him in an unusual position. I found this very intriguing. Jack Johnson, of course, uh, also well known in Galveston, being a born on the island uh, guy. Um, this is him around 1900 when he's 22 years old. So this would have been what he looked like at the time of the book, like time of the hurricane. Jack, of course, was there during the hurricane. Um, saved some people, you know, it, it, a lot of the stories are, of course, hard to verify, but he's, it seems um, that he was, uh, some, you know, at least somewhat of a hero during the hurricane, saved some people and everything else. And then a few months later, they decided to put on this fundraising boxing event, uh, Jack Johnson, and then, of course, they invite Joe Kowinski to come down, and it's going to benefit the American Red Cross. This is Jack Johnson a little bit later, a few years later, when he's really in his prime and you can see here now he's a formidable person. I also uh, I think this is one of the one of the sort of um, best photos of him, and it shows a sort of clean symmetry of his face and his body. Just a very attractive man had a very magnetic kind of um, not just appearance but also personality. And this is something that people at the time remarked upon for years. And and so when Joe Kowinski shows up, this is the man that he's uh, confronted with. Um, now. What really struck me when my wife told me this bit, um, she was like, did you know that that these two boxers, they were they were in this boxing match and then they got thrown in jail right at the culmination of the fight. So when they when they had this fight um, in the third round, Joe Kowinski knocks out Jack Johnson, knocks him out cold, which is the only time it's ever happened in Jack Johnson's career. He was knocked unconscious um, and immediately. Uh, Texas Rangers, about six Texas Rangers, jump into the ring. One of them fires a pistol into the air, points at uh, Joe Kowinski and says, you boys are going to the Crossbar Hotel. I mean, that's a real thing that they said. Like, you couldn't write that in a, in a story. It's almost it's too, it's too ridiculous, but that really happened. The, the Texas Rangers jumped in, fired a gun in the air, uh, put, put the, the, the handcuffs on, on Jack Johnson while he was still unconscious. Uh, took Joe away, put him in you know, a jail cell. Um, in, the, in the beginning, Jack Johnson was in the basement of the jail. Um, Joe, uh, eventually they ended up sharing a cell together for, for at least part of the time. Um, they were getting different kinds of treatment, of course, uh, as you would kind of sort of expect. Um, Joe was let out in the evenings to go to dinner with people, things like that. Uh, so it was, a, it was a strange kind of incarceration. Why were they arrested? Well, they're arrested for an illegal prize fight. And this is kind of tricky because um, prize fight laws differ by, back then they differed by county and city and state and everything else. But basically it was that you weren't allowed to fight for money in a, in, a, in a real fight where somebody's trying to knock somebody out, knock somebody down. Most fights were, were considered exhibitions is what they called them. It, the, the, the men were there ostensibly just to demonstrate what they called the science, the science of boxing, scientific boxing and stuff. And that was, you know, it was new and it's very interesting to people. This is, you know, this is in the first years of what's called the Queensberry era coming out of the, the bare knuckled era. So this was early boxing when the rules were just being established. And so, um, but when a, if a boxer, got, so what they would do is they would pay the boxer for this exhibition and they would often pay them. For example, Joe was offered his money to do exhibitions after the fight. He was going to basically give clinics or lessons kind of, and they would pay him for that. Um, but, you know, it was really about the fight. Um, and this happened all the time. And sometimes the cops would, would come in and bust it up, uh, something like that. But it was very rare just to come in and arrest everybody. And a, a lot of that has to do with... Uh, you know, with, 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 with Jack Johnson, um, you know, it was really about trying to get Jack Johnson to, to, 
um, get them in line, so to speak, behave, you know, th all these kinds of things. Um, and so because Joe knocked him out, uh, un you know, unconscious, that sort of triggered uh, the Texas Rangers. The governor, apparently the governor's office, it wasn't local officials who put those Rangers there. Was, these, are, these were state officials. So it had something to do with the governor's office. Uh, it's not really clear how that happened, but you know, the, my, my, my conjecture would be that some of the local officials, you know, asked them to come and hey, arrest this guy. Um, and of course, they had no problem locking up a Jewish guy with them. Joe, of course, was uh, you know uh, faced with anti-Semitic anti uh, taunts and behavior his whole his whole life. So. Um, they were incarcerated together for 23 days in this jail cell. And as you can, you know, they took a photo of it here and it was sort of this very bizarre kinds of incarceration because they boxed, they, they sparred together in the cell. The sheriff charged admission for people to come and watch these two boxers spar in, in the cell. Um, like I said, they were going out to dinner with like city officials and stuff. It was a very sort of strange um, incarceration, but um, this, that's a photo from that time together. Okay, also there at the time, Clara Barton. This is her around 1900 and the American Red Cross traveled, of course, to aid with the reconstruction and the effort um, after the, the storm. Uh, what was interesting about this to me was this was Clara's last mission that she did with the American Red Cross. She was uh, an older lady at this time. When she came back um, to Maryland after this, she was very soon after this, she basically retired or was um, sort of voted out of her position, but that's another thing. But anyway, this was sort of Clara Barton's last journey. Now, uh, you know, I, I so Clara Barton's there, and I thought um, I thought for a while that maybe I would want to use Clara Barton as one of the principal figures. But um, we know from the historical record that her role was diminished by this point. She was mainly writing a lot of letters, asking for money, thanking people for sending money, or you know, donations and everything. Um, and I needed somebody uh, from the Red Cross uh, that would be involved more, that would be around. And also, I was I was hesitant to try to inhabit the the, the you know Clara Barton, this major historical figure, kind of like Jack Johnson. There's so much written about him, biographies and other things that I I, I just felt there was so much to go there. I, I wanted to keep them sort of secondary characters. So uh, in order to do that, here's Clara Barton as a younger as a younger woman. Um, but in order to do that, I created a, another American Red Cross nurse, basically Clara's second in command. You know, it made sense that there would be a younger person there. That would be her assistant. That would be the next person. And that as Clara was uh, getting older and was having trouble getting around and accomplishing some of her normal tasks, that there were this other woman would be the one filling in. And so that seemed interesting to me. And so I, I needed this Red Cross figure because the, the boxing match that was put on was a fundraiser for the American Red Cross um, and their efforts. And the main efforts of the American Red Cross when they arrived there was basic humanitarian assistance. But one of the things they wanted to do was to help the storm orphans as they were called. And that's where all these children who had been newly orphaned by the storm. Okay. Another secondary important figure, important figure in, Amer in Texas history, of course, Texas Hall of Fame, History Hall of Fame guy, Rabbi Henry Cohen, um, another intriguing, this is somebody that my, that my wife's uh, research touched upon because he was involved with bringing immigrants through Galveston uh, for several decades. Um, so the way he gets involved in this is as I was reading accounts of Joe and Jack and their fight and then their incarceration, after Joe was incarcerated, the first person he wanted to talk to was Rabbi Henry Cohen. Now it makes sense because Rabbi Henry Cohen was probably the most powerful Jewish person on Galveston Island at the time. He was well known, well liked by, by you know, nearly everybody, except for people who didn't like the fact that he was bringing all these Jewish immigrants in. And that ruffled feathers, of course, the normal kinds of um, uh, racial, ethnic um, uh, sort of bigotry was, was, of course, going on at the time there as well. Um, but a, a well-known figure. And so it was an it was a interesting thing to kind of get him involved. He was part of the glue that kind of brought these all these elements together. Um, the Galveston movement was what what Henry Cohen's efforts were called. Um, there he is second the, from the left. And this is around the time. So a lot of my sort of imagining of Henry Cohen comes from images like this. 
He was known for for dressing in this way. He, re, he used to ride a bicycle uh, uh, like uh, uh, around, and he used to write notes on his cuffs of his shirts and in, in in ink pen, uh, um, bow ties, very starched waistcoats, and things like that. Um, a very interesting eccentric eccentric guy, uh, and so he was fun to to work with. And then we have the, the tragedy of the St. Mary's Orphan Asylum. This is a orphanage that existed in Galveston before the storm and Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word, which is a existing body of nuns to this day. They're all over the world. They have, um, they have uh, mon uh, orphanages still operating. Um, th there's a photo of it in Galveston in the 1890s. It was right there by the beach. Um, this is an image of some boys and girls from the Incarnate Word. I, it, I, we, don't, we don't know the exact date on this or exactly which, which is which, but there was, about, there was about 80 boys in one wing and another 80 uh, girls in another wing. Um, and the great sort of tragedy of this, where I came about this was after the storm, they started finding these girls. Um, the orphanage was totally destroyed. And the nuns during the storm had tied together all of the girls and themselves with one big length of clothesline with the idea that they wouldn't all be washed away. And so, of course, they were all found, you know, buried in the sound. They've been drowned all together in this huge chain. And there was something very sort of terrible about that to me. I, I, um, I, think, I think all of us, the mind naturally revolts at the idea of, of a tragedy of this kind, especially that every single one of them died. Um, I, I, so I immediately thought, well, what if what if one survived? I mean, it, it, you know, it just seemed possible, plausible. Um, and I needed somebody who was, you know, to experience the storm through, um, you know, because Joe wasn't there. I mean, I could have done Jack, but that was a different kind of thing. And, and, and Clara Barton wasn't there and um, couldn't find much accounts of what Henry Cohen was. So I got to create this, this, this is the opening chapters of the book where uh, you know, the experience of living through the storm, escaping uh, the situation, living through the storm and the immediate aftermath, which I thought would be just really compelling and kind of horrifying, especially for a very young kid. Um, and I was also intrigued by this notion of, um, of sort of being doubly orphaned. You know, she was an orphan and then she got you know, orphaned again. Um, and what would that do uh, as far as the trauma um, the, when the sisters, you know, these nuns, um, and their God um, couldn't couldn't save them and didn't and couldn't save any of them. And so um, Hester, the, my orphan girl, she's an unusual girl. I, you know, to, to survive something like this, it seems like it would need you need to be kind of an unusual person. So um, you know, somebody that had uh, resilient and resourceful and things like that. So um, so I created this character and. Um, that's how we got to, uh, to Hester. Okay, and then to this day, um, all the, the, the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word, all around the world, they sing this hymn. This was the favorite hymn of the girls in Galveston. And they, they sang this, um, they were singing this on the day, the last witnesses of the counts, um, in order to keep the girls calm. They, they were all together singing their favorite hymn, which was called Queen of the Waves. And to this day on the anniversary of the hurricane all around the world, um, nuns and orphans, and they all sing this song together to remember this tragedy in Galveston. Okay, and then here, here's the final photo where this is photo is actually in the back of the book. And this is one that I found there in the Rosenberg uh, Library Museum. And uh, this was intriguing to me because, you know, here we have this sort of very staged photo, obviously, Joe Kowinski there, Jack Johnson looking on in the middle. He's shaking hands with the sheriff, other notable figures lined up around here. The bottom right corner, um, I thought that was Henry Cohen for a while, but I, I'm not really sure. Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, but what, what struck me was the bottom right there, that little girl and this dog. Um, who, you know, who are unaccounted for or, you know, and, and so when I was there at the, at the museum doing research and I'd already sort of begun the process of this book, this was about six years ago. Um, and when I saw that little girl, I, you know, how did she come to be there? Why was she in this photo with Jack and, and Joe? 
um, and, and this dog. And so well, what if that was, you know, what if that was my orphan? And how, it, how would she come to be in this photo? Well, I mean, the American Red Cross was hosting, the, it was basically helping put the fight together because it was going to benefit them. Um, so that would put, you know, the fighters and the Red Cross and Henry Cohen and all these people together. And it made sense too, that if she was orphaned again, uh, you know, wandering around the wreckage, then the American Red Cross would be, you know, trying to corral her and she would interact with them and she would eventually come to, um, you know, to, to be included in their, their new storm orphan orphanage they were creating. Um, and then of course there's a dog. I mean, you know, who doesn't like a little girl and a dog? I thought it was, uh, it was kind of nice. And so that's, that photo, this photo right here is fundamental to, you know, this kind of opened the book up for me, I guess, in a, in a really important, powerful way. Um, you know, and just so you know that it, one of the things that makes this whole story very compelling is, 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 the, is the story of Jack Johnson after this. I mean, Jack Johnson in 1908 here, this is him when he fought Tommy Burns to win the heavyweight championship of the world, which he held for another like 12 years defended it many times more than anybody in history really just you know the greatest heavyweight boxer of all time most likely um just an astonishing career and one of the things that's very compelling about it is when he got out of this jail cell with joe kowinski he went on this great winning streak won like you know 30 fights in a row or something ridiculous and was seemed to be just a much better boxer and he told people throughout his whole life that um that it was his time with Kowinski in the jail cell that really taught him how to box I mean he was just a young tough guy he was obviously physically gifted um but when he was young you know he was just getting by on his on his sp speed and power um whereas Joe Kowinski had been fighting a long time for this point you know Joe Joe knew more of the science of boxing and um you know, taught him some things and particularly, you know, Joe talked about this and Jack that taught him some things about defensive skills, how not to get hit, uh, which made sense because they in the cell together and he just got, you know, Joe uh, got, you know, knocked him out. And, and so, you know, Joe taught him how not to get knocked out again. And he didn't get knocked out ever again, not unconscious like that. He only was never knocked down one, uh, uh, one more time in the next 20 years, really until much, much later than, than he was doing exhibitions and things. But, um, so that time in the jail cell, those 23 days fundamentally changed the way that he approached boxing, his skills, and helped make him this great champion. So, you know, I was thinking, well, what was going on in that jail cell? You know, like, what, how would that, how would that go? And, and that was very intriguing to me. I like to write about um, uh, athletic contests, so if, you know, physical endurance, all these kinds of things are intriguing to me. You know, what the body can do is intriguing to me. Um, and these two guys were, you know, amazing sort of specimens and what they accomplished there must have been something amazing. This is Jack Johnson later on in his career when he was uh, very rich and famous um, and controversial. You know, Jack Johnson didn't, um, he didn't subscribe to, you know, the normal kind of um, rules that were put in place for, for black people in those days. He, uh, uh, you know, he, he got in trouble a lot for it, but he never backed down. Um, he was, a, he was a remarkable figure. Um, and that in, in a nutshell really is the, the story of Oleander city and how I came to put this book together, the various historical pieces. Um, you know, I'll basically all I had to do was try to connect these elements that I just talked about, these characters in some kind of plausible dramatic arc, you know, which, and a lot of it was already done because you have this fight and you have the aftermath, they get arrested and thrown in jail, you have the storm orphans, you know, you have the Red Cross trying to find those storm orphans. Uh, yeah, there's a lot already going on. There were, there were of course, uh, the, but the part of the book involves extrajudicial uh, killing, lynchings, basically. There were gangs of masked men riding around. Um, ostensibly, you know, shooting looters, of which there were certainly plenty, um, but it also seems pretty clear that uh, certain people were using this as a way to um, rid the city of what, of what they felt were undesirables, and that mostly was, was Blacks and immigrants uh, and Jews. So a lot of really interesting conflict all happening in a very short period of time, all contained on this island, and all in the aftermath of the storm. So there was plenty of uh, drama and action and things to, 
to look at. So um, that's the story. And at this point, I'd be happy to entertain any kinds of questions or anything um, that anybody has about the book or anything related to it. Does anybody uh, here in person have questions? No, there was a few I talked to. OK, we've got one. Um, I guess I'm sort of fascinated by the way you represented the committee. Um, they don't come across as looking particularly leader worthy, I guess, which is the way to put it. Yeah. Uh, can, can you hear her, Matt? I can't. Can you? Can she, you was, it? she said that um, the, the committee, they didn't look, what do you say? Uh, Not particularly leader worthy. They didn't look particularly leader worthy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The committee, um, yes, the, 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 the committee there, there, there were, there were not notable problems. There, there, there is, there is some um, accounts of um, manipulation, let's say, and um, people skimming off the top. There was a lot of money and stuff flowing in. And after a while it turned into this problem, the logistical problem. And people started complaining that the, all the food and, and, and good water and everything else was going to certain areas. So there's a lot of um, that kind of thing going on as well. The, the idea that one of the principal leaders of the committee would be involved in what seems to be a kind of a, a, a KKK type organization, um, there's not a lot of direct evidence of the actual KKK. You know, in the book, I never say, I never call anything the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan or anything like that. But there were men riding around on horseback wearing masks with holes in their, you know, it was very similar kind of thing. Um, but the, the character of Crane, for example, um, that is a fabrication of my own. Um, there's no particular evidence of a single figure on that committee. Um, the committee um, that because Henry Cohen was part of it, there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of evidence of friction about that. They, 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 they respected Henry Cohen as a, as a businessman and a guy who got things done, but they didn't like um, all these Jewish immigrants showing up. Um, so there was, there's, there's, you know, there's evidence of um, some problems, but the extent of this, the extent of it and how they seem to be kind of spearheading the efforts um, um, in, in the book, that's, that's all a, a creation of my own. Um, I, I, I needed, you know, there needed to be a, a, an antagonist, you know, there has to be a, I, I knew I couldn't really just have the storm be the antagonist or the survival of the storm because, because you have the boxing match and you have all this other stuff going on. So really what I was, who I was trying to get at was the person, the people that put that telegram together, you know, the ones that wanted to shut up Jack Johnson, that thought he was a big, fresh, you know, I, all that stuff, like who, whoever, you know, did that, who, who was the committee of, and it was, it was leaders, it was people in charge because the, the committee helped organize, you know, what was the main, the main people who organized this boxing match. Um, so there were people in high positions who really did not like Jack Johnson, um, wanted somebody to come down there to beat him up. Um, so that's who I was sort of inhabiting was those unknown uh, figures, sort of shadowy background figures, at least in the historical record, um, so yeah, the committee, uh, you know, th there are people in the, in the book that, that, um, that come off not, you know, they don't come off well, but of course, like Crane and Balestri, like the principal, those principal villains, those are all fabricated. Those aren't real people or real names or anything. Um, I, I, you know, anybody that was a real person like Henry Cohen, I, I didn't, um, I didn't go out of my way to make them better or worse. I tried to stay close to what we knew about them, but also to be kind of, um, you know, as, as sort of truthful to the spirit of the thing as I, as I, as I could be. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't interested in glorifying necessarily anybody, but I didn't necessarily also want to, you know, degrade somebody, um, you know, in, in, in some kind of, you know, um, purposeful way. Um, so, the, the committee is, is, you know, was more, it started off more as kind of a, a faceless group 
Um, but then I knew I, I kind of needed a singular figure because the because of what Hester goes through. I needed a I need a, a, a face to attach to the, you know, to the bad guys, so to speak. Um, so now, yeah, that the, the committee is largely um, fabricated, and yeah. Are there any other questions about the characters, character development, about the book, about Matt? Anything? Oh, we've got a really quiet crowd today. Does anybody on Zoom have any questions? Must have been a very thorough presentation. Okay, we've we've got one in the back. <laughs> I was just wondering, what is he working on now? What are you working on now, Matt? What's your next? Yeah, I'm working on a a, a new book that's it's 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 not a historical novel. Um, I seem to have this pattern where I do a, I do a, a non-historical novel and then I'll do a historical and then non and then historical. So the new one is actually a, uh, a near future. It's about 10 years in the future. So it's, you know, it's not like science fiction or something like that, but it's just a, what we call near future. It's just, um, and it takes place mostly in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, and it involves a, a this mega church, um, and it, it actually has kind of some supernatural elements. So it, it's actually quite different from from this. Um, I, you know, I, my, my first book was was set in London, and it was a present day about an Egyptologist working at the British Museum. My second book was What Is Counting the World, which is 1930s Virginia historical novel. Third book was was um, the Night Swimmer, which was present day Ireland, um, about this, this couple that moves to an island off the coast of Ireland. Um, and and then now Oleander City, uh, you know, 1900. And so now I'm just kind of, uh, basically every book has been has been different and 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 quite different. And uh, my, my publishers hate it. Um, and because I don't, I, I haven't done a good job of, of keeping an audience, they say, you know, that, like, it, there are, there are authors out there that that kind of write more consistently and so they retain the same readers throughout um i haven't done a really good job of that i think i think a lot of people who liked what is counting the world my other historical novel will like this one quite a bit there's a lot of similarities between them um but um you know the writing style and certainly some of the thematic stuff you know carries over but um you know, I, I, I think I get bored with, I, I just don't want to do the same thing. I want to keep doing different things. I want to try, I want to try something new with every book, uh, something that I haven't done before. Uh, something that kind of, like, if it's not interesting to me, if I can, if I'm not frightened of it, if I'm not, you know, worried about it in some way, then, then there's not much, there's not much there for me. So I'm, I'm not a writer that can kind of just keep churning out the same thing. Like there's no going to, there's not going to be Oleander City 2, you know, this, this is never going to happen. Um, I, you know, my, my, my time with Galveston, everything I want to say about it in uh, that period and everything else and the, and these characters, you know, it's, it's in there. So moving on in a fresh direction. So it'll be about three years. Probably. It takes me three, four years at least to write a book. Um, th three of my books took about four years each. And then this one took longer. This one took um, almost 10 years, but that's because I published another book. Uh, I mean, I didn't publish another book. I wrote another book. <laughs> um, it, it, in, in the first five years, I wrote a, uh, which I think is a great book, um, but it just, it uh, just failed. It just, it didn't work. Um, and it was a big one. It was like a 450 page book and I spent a lot of time on it and I'm still, um, it's still a mystery what's wrong with it, but, um, so I had to start over uh, with a new one. And so that's why it took me 10 years. I also, I have, I have th I, you know, I, we had three children. <laughs> so a lot of other things intervened, but um, I'm glad to finally get this one out. Oh, so I see, I see some questions here on the chat. So when, when, uh, when writing historical novels such as this one, how do you limit or choose what you include? That's a very difficult question, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to read everything possible at first, you know, I'm trying to find every book about the area. I, I mean, I, I literally go into my university library and I'll find everything about the Galveston hurricane, for example, 
and I'll just pull them all off the shelf. You know, I'll take the whole thing off the shelves. And because I'm faculty, you know, I'm an English professor at the University of Mississippi here. I can I can check books out for like a year. <laughs> so um, so I get everything. I, I, I read all the stuff I can find. Um, and then I'm just I'm really I'm just kind of note taking like the things that are most notable um, and interesting. And I'm, so I'm compiling sheets of notes. I might st I'm, I'm starting at this point. I'm starting a scene. I'm starting to write, but I'm still compiling all these notes. And really, I'm just selecting the things that are most interesting, most notable. There's all so much. I mean, there's a lot more historical information that could have gone into this book. This could have been twice as long. I could have, you know, there's a lot known about, uh, you know, all these people that I could have deepened their characters. I could have, you know, done so much more. Um, but you have to you have to make choices um, based on several factors. One of them that's very important to me is pacing. Um, you know, I, I learned this lesson in my first book, which had a lot of Egyptology in it. You know, I, I was working at the British Museum at the time. Egyptology was sort of a hobby of mine. I was really into hieroglyphics and I was just filling it up with all this hieroglyphics in Egyptology. And I'm my agent, you know, and I gave it to him. He, he would, you know, he would mark out stuff. And one stage, he just drew big lines, big X's through like 10 pages in a row, just like, nope 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 because it was all this Egyptology you know it's all this like stuff that I think is cool so all this history you know and that's the problem with, with historical novels for me I think all this stuff's really cool but I can't put it all in or else the story just bogs down doesn't go anywhere so I start you know I start writing the scenes and I'm doing it scene by scene and I'm thinking about what details can work um, and then at a certain point I, I, I kind of stop I, I'll, I'll stop about three quarters of the way through um I'll stop acquiring new stuff or I'll stop even sifting through my notes because I already realize I've got enough. I've got too much already. Um, I'm going to have to cut some of what I got in here already. And I need to focus on the characters, you know, bringing them to life, um, the, the plot, you know, or, and then, and then the pacing momentum are things moving. So you have to make sacrifices. You have to sort of, and, and then I will purposely not look at anything else because you could, it'll, you could go on forever. And as soon as you finish the book, um, somebody will send you something or you'll find, you'll discover another source of something really amazing. And you're like, oh my gosh, that should have been that. And so that'll go on forever. It's still, it's, it's happening all the time right now with the Oleander City in Galveston or whatever, you know, I'm, the stuff keeps coming up and you have to just turn away. I mean, I think, you know, at some point you have to sort of turn away from it um, and, and okay, I'm not, I'm sorry, I can't, there's no, you know, so you kind of have to make those kinds of very difficult decisions, but a lot of it's just really, you know, the, the, the choices are about what I just, what I think is really cool. What are the things that the, the details that are cool, interesting to me. Um, and then you just kind of leave stuff out, you know, and then when you go through revision, you're, you're cutting stuff out, you know, cause it's too slow. It's bogging stuff down. And then the other factor in the, this is you want to leave enough space, imaginative space for the writer, for you as the writer, for me as the writer to, to create, to, to do something fun, to, to, to entertain myself and hopefully the reader, you know, um, because otherwise if I'm just, if I'm just taking all historical facts and I'm trying to package it and arrange it in some kind of plot, um, you know, I might as well do a nonfiction account. And, you know, like a book like Isaac Storm, you know, which probably a lot of you, a lot of you guys are familiar with, which is kind of like the account of this of the Galveston hurricane. Uh, you know, it's a brilliant piece of nonfiction, but you know, that's not a book that I would ever do because I'm I, I want to inhabit characters and I want to create things. I want to I want to speculate on what Joe is thinking when he's laying there in that jail cell, and that you know, and Jack Johnson's right over there after they just had this fight. You know, just all this sort of strangeness. Um, I want to, I want to inhabit and try to um, do that stuff myself, you know. So that those that, that's how the choices come about. Um, there's another question here from Jacqueline. How did much of the background research come from the Rosenberg Library? Uh, you know, a, a bit. I the, I was I was over like I said. I was getting a lot of text materials. I was you know I was scouring the internet. If, but the, the internet there's there's so much that you you really have to stop at some point. Just stop looking. So I would I found some good sites, some good places, read some good articles, a couple things, did a lot of books. And then, and then I definitely want to be, you know, all of the novels I've done, as I kind of outlined to you, you know, I, I used to live in London, worked at the British Museum. I lived on the coast of Ireland. I spent a lot of time there. Um, of course, the What is Counting the World is about my grandfather. And is, you know, so, so every, um, I used to live in Dallas too. So my, my new book, but every story, um, uh, I, I, I definitely want to be there. I want to walk in those places, the spaces. 
Um, I, I want to walk around the streets of Galveston, on the beaches of Galveston, all over the place, which I have and I did. Um, just picking up the feeling of it, the tone, the mood, um, obviously things like weather and everything else, and just sight, sound, sensory data, anything that I could work with. Um, so I was doing all that. And, and then, you know, so I did go to the Rosenberg Library a couple of times. Um, and that was more, more like just sort of looking for a couple notable things, maybe like, is there anything else really big or important that I may have missed? And, and I found that photo there, which is a big deal. But, um, but I would say in the end, not, you know, not just because I'd done so much other preliminary research, I'd found a lot of other stuff. So I'd say in the end, it was only maybe like 15% or so or 20% came from the Rosenberg Library. I mean, I, 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 I just enjoyed going there. I just enjoyed looking at all the stuff. And I looked at lots of things there, uh, got articles, got photos. They gave me all these albums of photos, you know, and I looked at lots of things. I didn't necessarily use it all, you know, but um, it was sort of like the, 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 the crowning um, last 15% or so was, was how Roseburg. And also because I, I you know, cause I don't live there and I'm, I'm, you know, so I don't get, I only get there maybe a couple times a year. So, um, the, you know, basically when I, when we get there, uh, the last time I went, um, for research, you know, my family was there and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the library for, for the day. You guys go to the beach or whatever. Um, so, you know, it was like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say the Rosenberg library is, is, was valuable. Um, it's extremely, it's been extremely valuable for this kind of thing, the way they've embraced the book and the way they supported me and arranged events like this. So I owe, I owe a lot to the Rosenberg library for, for everything. And I know my publisher is very happy with them and I, and I, I'm a huge fan of the institution, so I'll always go there and for whatever they whatever they have on on display. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, you imply in your book that the Jews helped the blacks or stood up with them. Could you, did you have a lot of research on that? Did you hear her, Matt? Not quite. No. Um, she, she said that in your book, um, kind of a lot of the Jewish community helped the African-American community. Um, there kind of seemed to be a sense of help in that, in that regard. And could you elaborate more on that? And what did your research show you about that? Yeah. Um, yes. That, um, I would say that the, the, the evidence that I've seen, you know, indicates a, 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 a general, um, sort of broad level of support um, in the aftermath of the storm and in some other periods of, the, of these, um, of those, those two groups in particular. Um, we know, for example, there was a famous preacher um, whose children were murdered by, by, by men, uh, masked men, um, on horseback, you know, carrying torches, um, that the that Henry Cohen and the uh, you know sort of tried to galv you know, uh, galvanize his his people together to support uh, the, the, this preacher who's trying to get justice. You know, and this is something I fictionalized in the book. Um, but uh, I, I I don't have I don't have a whole lot of evidence of a lot of very direct support. Um, it, it's a lot of more um, sort of very broad based um, and then just sort of conjecture on my, on my, on my point, um, mostly coming from um, Rabbi Cohen, because Rabbi Cohen, you know, you read his biography and things, he was, a, he was always a champion of the dispossessed or underrepresented people or whatever. I mean, he was constantly um, seeking to address wrongs whoever they and so I, I i feel confident that he would have been um very concerned about the situation and the way that um that 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 poor communities in particular the communities the black communities and immigrant communities were being treated in the aftermath um which is to say they were kind of left to their own devices you know for a while you know it's it's, it's the same old story i mean people um, you know, the Katrina anniversary just passed and people have remarked upon, um, some readers even told me that this, you know, they lived through Katrina and this book brought back. Um, so it's the same story. It's been going, it's still going on. And, 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 and I hope, 
you know, I, I wanted the book to be, I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to write a book that's like uh, about today, but um, it's clear that a lot of, a lot of uh, these kinds of things still occur. Um, so, you know, really to answer your question is I, I don't have a whole lot of good evidence for that, uh, for the direct kind of collusion of black and, and Jewish uh, communities on the island, you know, trying to, other than the Rabbi Henry Cohen. Um, um, so I just kind of lumped, lumped that together. Um, um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the black preachers in the island, they did get together a big group of people, they did protest, um, you know, there were, there were, so some of those scenes that I have in the book were, were drawn from that. Um, the, the relative participation of Jewish communities, I, I don't quite know that um, for sure. So I wouldn't really have much good evidence for that, those instances. Um, I'm going to step in front of the camera. Um, thank you, Matt, for speaking tonight. And I just kind of want to follow up on your last comments. Um, in my exhibit that I'm about to open on September 8th in two days is on the 1900 storm, um, which is a huge reason why I invited you here to speak tonight, because your story kind of really uh, goes really well with my exhibit opening. And if you go into the exhibit, you'll see that my story talks about Henry Cohen and Clara Barton both in some of Henry Cohen's humanitarian efforts um, and how he helped people, not only during the storm, but after. I mean, he's he's huge. I, he, has, he, has, he has roots in suffrage. He had roots in prison reform. Um, he, he was really a great person at this time. And I named my dog after him. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I hope all of you come to my exhibit and you can kind of see and read for yourselves about Henry Cohen and Clara Barton themselves. Yeah. And so um, thank you again, Matt, for your time. Um, and thank you everybody in Zoom who participated at home. Um, I'm sorry I don't have the next book picked out for Museum Book Club, but if you're on my email list, you'll hear from me very soon. So, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Good night, everybody. All right.